All right, welcome to CS4510. I think the tie is 09A, hope so. 09A, uh, the topic of today is, there's not a really good title for this one, but I'll call it simulation evidence. Uh, the church Turing thesis we gave, Alan, last time we talked about the church Turing thesis, we gave Alan Turing's quote unquote proof of it. Uh, And he solved this great problem with it. He invented the Turing machines, and he needed the Turing machines to solve one problem. We'll talk about what that problem is later. Uh, Alonzo Church invented the lambda calculus, and he had something like the Church Turing thesis, where he was like, yeah, every, anything you could compute, anything that would be, quote unquote, effectively calculable, could be done with lambda calculus. But his proof was far less convincing, uh, quote unquote proof, was far less convincing than Alan Turing's proof. So really, it's Alan Turing should be the one to get all the credit. Um, they published independently, but uh, Alonzo Church beat Alan Turing to the press by only a couple months. And then Turing was like 21 years old, and he went to study with, uh, he became a PhD student under Alonzo Church later. So, um, Simulation evidence is basically like, the Turing machine is a very stupid computer, right? It has three instructions. It can read, write, and move conditionally. So obviously, um, one attempt may be to try to invent a computer. Let's try to generalize the definition of a Turing machine. And uh, it turns out that every generalization you can think of of a Turing machine ends up being equivalent in power to the Turing machine. Before we get into the, what, it, what we call the simulation evidence in favor, is that the simulation evidence, again, just to repeat myself, is that generalizations of the Turing machine fail to decide strictly stronger language classes. So like, you can come up with obviously more powerful computers than a Turing machine because a Turing machine is so simple. Uh, because it, uh, but each of them will fail to be strictly stronger they'll end up being equivalent. That's what the simulation evidence will be. Before we do that, let's, let's restate a, a way to apply the, uh, the Church-Turing thesis. It says, like, if, uh, if C is fathomable, it satisfies our, fathom, our, our uh, loosely defined fathomability criterion, and C itself is loosely defined from an, some perhaps unknown universe of discourse over all possible mechanical procedures, computational processes, uh, you know, decision procedures, whatever C is, a set of rules uh, to do something somehow can fit in the framework of accepting and rejecting strings. Uh, if C is fathomable, um, then uh, whatever class of languages is decided or produced or generated or enumerated or whatever by C, this can only be a subset of the languages decided by Turing machines. The Turing machine, in some sense, is therefore the ultimate computer. And again, the, the proof of this involves the fact that LTM is equal to L human, and that if it's fathomable, simply simulate it on your brain. Right? Uh, another way it may be uh, equivalent to say this is if, uh, uh, for all C, uh, if uh, C fathomable, uh, excuse me, let's say this, this way, uh, there does not exist uh, C. Uh, such that C is fathomable, and uh, C is strictly stronger than a Turing machine. Pretty useful way to think of it. The Turing machine, in some sense, is the strongest computer, uh, up to this reasonable uh, fathomability criterion. It's sort of our little cope mechanism there. Um, so we're going to create today several generalizations of the Turing machine. We're going to take the Turing machine give it a bunch of features, and then we'll fail to literally generalize the Turing machine. So we'll be left to conclude evidence in favor of the church Turing thesis. This is a more classical argument, is the, is the simulation evidence. Right? So uh, first generalization of the Turing machine is more of a warm up. Recall the transition function of a Turing machine. Um, it takes a state, it reads a symbol off the tape, and Transitions to a new state, writes a symbol, and then chooses to move left or right. The reason we use this definition of the Turing of the Turing machine, even though there are many generalizations of the Turing machine, we use this definition of the Turing machine because it makes all the proofs simpler. Like every proof you could use with Turing machines may have several edge cases or something. So you use the definition of the Turing machine that's going to eliminate the most edge cases. It turns out this is the one. When you see this definition of the Turing machine, the first question you may have is, well, I can move left or right, but what about staying still? 
What if I don't want to move left to right? So what we'll do is we'll define a, a model of computation called the state Turing machine, um, which is identical, except it is allowed to now uh, stay put. So we say it can move left, it can move right, but now it can stay. Obviously, we see that this is a generalization of a Turing machine. Okay, Ob Immediately obvious to us should, should be the fact that every Turing machine can be simulated by a stay Turing machine. Well, let L stay TM be the class of languages decidable by a Turing machine that has an additional stay instruction. Instead of L and R, it has L, R, and now S, right? Um, so we've created a generalization of the Turing machine. But it turns out that we can't, it's not strictly stronger. We are trying to, we can't just simply apply the church Turing thesis and say, well, state TM is fathomable, therefore this. We're trying to, pro trying to provide evidence in favor of it. So by the evidence in favor of it, we're going to pr basically do the simulation of it. Give me a reason, give me the simulation, why is L state TM a subset of LTM? Because for every instruction that is staying on a state TM, you could just have <coughs> two instructions on a normal Turing machine, one which just moves you in one direction with an epsilon and the other one that moves you back with the instruction. That ah, an epsilon. You almost got it. An epsilon is a non-deterministic transition. And importantly, and actually today we'll talk about a non-deterministic Turing machine, but an epsilon is uh, a deterministic because we're, in fact, importantly to the definition of a Turing machine is that it's deterministic, because we are deterministic, right? Um, but you're basically right. Staying, the, the, the stay instruction can be simulated by two instructions, right? So if the Turing, we simulate a state Turing machine by a normal Turing machine, if the, if the stay machine makes left or right moves, you just do the same thing. But if you have a stay instruction, let's say you have from QI, you read an A, you write a B, whatever those are, and you stay. If you, for every stay instruction, you modify the transition function of the Turing machine to move right and then immediately move back left. So the way we would write this is we would say QI to some added state Q back to QJ. We just pad in with this dummy state. What we're going to do is we're going to read an A, write a B, and move right. And then we're at some dummy state Q we've added. Then what we're going to do is we read an A, write an A, read a B, write a B, or read a blank, write a blank, whatever the, whatever the uh, alphabet is of the tape, and we simply move back left, right? So to give you the picture, it's going to read the A, write a B, and then move right, and then just move back left. That's the same thing as staying. By the entrance into QJ, it's as if you stayed the whole time. Right. The reason we don't want the stay instruction in general, like why didn't we define the normal Turing with stay instruction, is because you want sequential configurations of the machine to be different. Right. It turns out the stay instruction is a useless one. Like if you read the same symbol back, I mean, you could have just done that to begin with. Right. Yeah. Is there a shorthand for read any character in the language, write the same character? Unfortunately, no. I mean, if you do this, it's sort of... Uh, do you read the same symbol back? It's not obvious from the notation. So unfortunately, by the limitations of the Turing machine. So a Turing machine has three instructions, a conditional read, write, move. But they're actually tripled up. They're, they're reading, writing, and moving is one triple. Reading, writing, moving, one triple. But if you think about this, you could generalize this and say move, read, write, move, read, write, move, move, read, read, write, something. You know, Stuff like that can be done, just as a sequence of triples. So it is kind of like a three instruction computer, but they have to come in triples by the definition, by the formal definition. Right. The formal definition that we have, like also the one that Alan Turing initially came up with? Absolutely not, in fact. Alan Turing didn't even, I don't know why I said absolutely not. That's not, that's not dramatic enough. Alan, Alan Turing didn't know what a string was. It's crazy that these guys were trying to do computer science. Alan Turing is such a genius. He had to invent computer science. He had never seen a computer in his life, okay? He has to write this paper, and it has to be, go through peer review, and it has to pass all these uh, 
um, his contemporaries, but mathematicians at the time only knew what a function was or a triangle was. You know, set theory was relatively new, like people were doing limits and things. So in fact, instead of talking about sets as, um, instead of talking about machines that decide languages, they take on input a string and they output a string, he actually even considered decimal expansions of real numbers. So a real number that has a binary decimal ex expansion of a, of, that takes in no input and just prints the digits of a binary number. We will later see rigorously that all these theories are equivalent and that a theory of computation just has to be put in some framework. Here we use the, the framework of decision problems where they like, you compare and contrast sets, right? In fact, his definition was a little cumbersome. And today we have a much better, simpler definition. And it is the one, and it's the one that has the, it just makes the proofs easier. When we did the church Turing thesis and we reduced the human, the creature, down to the Turing machine, we made several uh, simplifications. But if you make different simplifications, you'll get a different Turing machine. And the argument is still correct. For example, we assumed that the number of squares moved at once was 1, and the number of squares that could be scanned at a single time was 1. We said L is equal to B is equal to 1, right, in his proof. But he just said that there is a bound to the number of squares that can be read and a bound to the number of squares that can be moved. But you could take his proof, quote unquote proof, and transform it to a proof that says um, a Turing machine which moves two squares at a time and read and writes to two squares at a time, that one actually ends up being as powerful as a normal Turing machine. Right? That can still compute the same thing. So we will talk about Turing completeness in the second half of the lecture. Today's just on the simulation evidence. But the, the two concepts are very related. Um, so this is not the, not the definition at all that Dallin Turing gave. Um, right. State TM we see is uh, no more, although it is a generalization of a Turing machine we gave it an additional instruction, it is not strictly stronger. Right. Questions on this proof? Important here is the word simulation, right? A simulation is one machine by another. We gave a simulation proof for many things we've done. We did a CFG to PDA proof back and forth. We did a DFA by an NFA proof, right? And so on. One machine simulates another. If one machine makes an instruction, the simulator does the same, perhaps in a sequence of steps, but does the same step. Computation is a process. Each, the simulation is correct if each of it's a composition of correct steps, right? This does one stay instruction. This does several instructions that simulate the stay. But it's the, it ends up being correct in the end. If this accepts, this one accepts. If this rejects, this rejects. If this loops, this loops, and so on. Right? Questions? OK, let's give the, a second generalization of a Turing machine, which is the one Alan Turing actually uh, defined. And in fact, many books define this, is that uh, you define the tape to be two-way infinite bi-directional, whatever. Uh, a, 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 uh, the Turing machine tape, as we define it, is one-way infinite, right? We gave the picture. We said there's an end to the tape, right? Something like this. And that there's blanks going off in one direction. But in fact, you can define a Turing machine to be bi-directionally infinite if it's infinite in both ways. It's infinite to the left of it. It's infinite to the right of it. This is the original definition of a Turing machine. One of the reasons we like the single directional definition is simply because then you can index each cell by an integer, right? Excuse me, by a natural number. You don't have to worry about negative numbers, ne negative indices. Um, but in fact, the double infinite tape is pretty useful for programming. Uh, you have extra, it's as if you have extra memory. You have like twice as much tape. You can do twice as many things. Um, certainly, uh, it is true that the single Turing machine, the, the one-way infinite Turing machine, can be simulated on by a, what we would call the two-way uh, Turing machine or the bidirectional Turing machine, right? Where the tape is two-way infinite. Um, but unlike just saying that every Turing machine is a state Turing machine. We can't simply say that every Turing machine is a two-way Turing machine. There's a very small technical issue we need to resolve with this simulation direction. What is it? Let's see if we can spot it. We need like a stopping character to prevent you from. That's basically what's going to be the proof is. Some Turing machines may be poorly programmed. Recall that if you are a Turing machine, uh, we define that if you are on the uh, leftmost cell, and you attempt to move even more leftmost, 
what will happen is the read and write will perform correctly. You, you're, the tape head will hit a brick wall. The gears will make a funny noise. And then you'll actually stay. So you can't move left off the tape, but you just are stuck there. Some programs, some Turing machines actually can use this as a feature. Like, you know when you're in the first cell, if you mark the symbol, move left, and it, you read a marked symbol, that means the same symbol you read was the last one you wrote. So that's actually a feature. You can use sort of C. People, C programmers can use all kinds of crazy undefined behavior to get features they want. And unfortunately, uh, we have to simulate those undefined behaviors correctly. So if the Turing machine never attempts to move left off the le last leftmost square, the simulation is obvious because you simply use only the, the right side of the tape. But unfortunately, we have to perform the simulation correctly for the unbounded ways. For If the Turing machine does try to move left off the tape. This Turing machine moves left off the tape, it hits the wall. This Turing machine moves left off the tape, it correctly moves to the negative one index cell, right? How do you make sure that that doesn't happen when you perform this simulation of the simpler machine on the more complicated machine? Just like replace every move left step with like a special case where if you hit the edge on your infinite tape, then you just automatically move back to the right immediately again. How do you know when you've hit the edge? Well, That's half the answer. Like you just pre-index everything with a special character, like. Basically, the, that's, that's basically what's gonna happen. Here's what I'll, the way I'll word this. Let's say this is some normal Turing machine. What you're going to do is you're going to begin uh, first by pre-marking uh, it. So you say read an A, write an A, read a B, write a B, read a blank, write a blank, and you're going to move left. Okay. So what you're going to do here is the input on a two-way infinite tape is going to look like this. Blanks, 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 W1, W2, Wn. Okay. The tape head, of course, is going to begin on W1. What you do is you read, write that same symbol back, and move left. So you're not the first blank to the left. What you're going to do is then just create a special symbol that's going to read a blank and write a dollar sign and then move right. So what you're going to do here is you're going to read the, read the blank, write the dollar sign, and then move right. So now you've started on W1 again. Then you enter the normal Turing machine, whatever's going on in there. And any time for each state, you add a self loop. If you read a dollar sign, write the dollar sign back, and then just move right. That's all it is. If you're anywhere here, and you go here, and you read the dollar sign, you have accidentally indexed the negative part. So what that means is anytime you read the dollar sign, you write the dollar sign back, and you move left. Excuse me, you move right. So that's how the computation works. That's how you simulate the quote unquote brick wall. So this simulation, although it's obvious that the two-way Turing machine is a generalization of the Turing machine, we needed an extra sentence on the simulation, right? So we have a model that is stronger than a Turing machine, but it turns out it's not strictly stronger. Perhaps we will take this as evidence. We will prove that a two-way Turing machine may be simulated on a Turing machine. Before we do this step, any questions on that one? Do we believe why the simulation works with the little marker? Sort of a little trivial kind of feature we need to implement. Um, how should this work? Do the Hilbert Hotel thing. So you like make two copies of it. One that like moves right, like each of them move right too instead of moving right once. And then like you basically have like, so you start with a special like end character. Okay. And then you make two copies of the Turing machine and you replace every time you move right or left with moving right or left twice. So you, so to reword what you're saying, index half of the tape in the even cells and index half of the tape in the odd cells. Correct. That is one simulation that works perfectly fine. Uh, but there's a more direct simulation that technically is better. We'll talk about countability actually next lecture. So hold on to that one. That will work. But there's another way to do it. Yes? Yeah, I'm going to fold the tape in half. What does folding the tape in half mean? The simulation uh, is actually a little complicated, but let me...
We're going to take that. That's our tape. Um, oh, I haven't moved the camera. Okay, I'm going to take the tape, and then I'm going to do one of these to it. I'm going to crease the tape at some point, and I'm going to fold it in half. And what's going to end up, our tape is going to look like. So what we're going to have is we're going to have a new alphabet, gamma squared, which is going to be, look like A over B, such that A and B are in gamma. So we're going to create two symbols in each cell, essentially. And we're going to grow the tape alphabet in such a way that we can uh, compactify the two halves by folding it over. Basically, is like um, if in uh, a right half, uh, if we read an A, we write a B, and we move right. This is going to look like for all u, we're going to read an a over u, write a b over u, and move right. right? Um, but if in left half, as in left half of the tape, and if we read an a, write a b, and we move right, and suppose we move right in the left half of the tape, but we don't move to the other half, what we're going to do is for all u, we're going to read an a, uh, read a u over a, write a u over b, and then we're going to move left. So the computation, suppose, for example, we're here, and we're going to be moving left. The way this works is we move left in the top, we bounce back, and we start moving right. You basically will make two copies of the Turing machine, and then you'll transition to between the two copies after some marked symbol that exists here or something, right? Transition between the two copies, except one has every left is a right, every right is a left, and so on, right? Um, this one, I think, is a pretty creative exercise. You guys can come up with several others. The index, the odd, even one is a good solution. There's a few others you could do. Um, at the beginning of the semester, we mentioned something about, a th about how to compactify a, like we talked about DFAs, and we mentioned that an another model of computation could be done with just three states. Do you, does anyone remember that? Something about, I said something about Shannon's proof. Basically, you can grow the alphabet to be really good. If you make the alphabet tuples of stuff, you can read and write 10 symbols at once, right? This is basically how it works. And then you could make the Turing, you could quote unquote speed up the Turing machine. Not really though, it doesn't, it doesn't nothing is actually in, in, in theory sped up. Right. Questions on this proof? For a second time, we've created a generalization of the Turing machine, twice as much tape. Uh, it can't do anything useful with it because of course we can simulate it on a two tape Turing machine. So any language that a two way machine could do, turns out there exists a normal Turing machine for that as well. So obviously, you have two of something. Uh, the generalization, there's only three numbers, 0, 1, and n. So let's suppose we have k tapes. And we define a k tape Turing machine to be as the following. Um, it has, I'm going to draw a picture of, let's say, a three tape machine. The machine can read and write to each head individually. And it can move on each tape head individually. Right? So the th this is called a K-tape Turing machine. It has access to K-tapes, each one-way infinite. And the transition function looks like uh, you take, you're at some state, and you read simultaneously K symbols. You move to a new state, you write k symbols, and then you can move each head independently, l left or right, or even stay. We can even add stay. It's fine, right? So we may de describe this machine as a k tape Turing machine. So we'll call it k tm, right? 
Certainly, it's true that the Turing machine can be simulated on the K-tape uh, machine. The K-tape machine is a direct and obvious generalization. Why is this true? You don't need to even have a little simulation detail like that one where you have to modify it with a little marker. Here you just say, I'm going to ignore the K tapes. The instantiation of the machine, by the way, you could say, you know, W1 to WN begins on the first tape. The second, the other tapes are all blanks. That's how the K tape machine is also initialized. Um, also, K is a finite number. There are other machines you can talk about that can spawn their own processes, processes and stuff, and like have more tapes as computation continues. That's not what a K-tape machine is. K-tape machine K fixed, right? Uh, so the K-tape Turing machine is an obvious generalization of the one-tape Turing machine, um, and also it's still even deterministic. Uh, how would you guess the simulation would go of a K-tape machine on a one-tape deterministic Turing machine? <laughs> There's a catch compared to the last one, is that the tape heads may move independently. Would you do like a Cartesian product of the like states of the original? Like, well, a transition of a K tape machine may read all the tapes simultaneously in transition only on that. For example, it may say all the symbols I'm reading are in A. Only then will I transition. So it would be hard to do so without, it, without a, perhaps a manual way, and then you have a description that perhaps is complicated. There are actually two proofs of this. I, I didn't know there were two proofs. I, I, I only thought there was one proof. Uh, second book has a totally different proof of this simulation. So there's two interesting ideas here. The, K, the tape compression thing would work. Uh, it were it not for that each head is independent. So here's an impo important feature about Turing machines. They have an infinite tape, right? But it's not infinite at any moment in time. If a Turing machine, we care about the machines that halt, the machines that stop after a certain number of steps. If a machine stops after k steps, it can use at most k new cells of the tape, right? So although there may exist machines that diverge, that use infinitely many cells, if you take the limit of them, at every instant that you examine them, only finite of the tape has been used at each instant. So what you will do is create another Turing machine, which puts all the K-tapes on the one tape, and then at each instant of the K-tape machine, it has used also only finite of its space. Here's the picture we'll do. I'll even put it here. What we'll do is create one machine that accesses a tape, and it has a tape that looks like this. Okay, what you do is you just put the K tapes on the machine. The tape is initialized in the following way. Right? All the other tapes are blanks. What you do is you put a little dot to represent the marker. You put the dot to represent the position of the ith head on the ith tape. What you do then is for every transition that the K tape machine does, you will involve a large subroutine that takes a non-trivial amount of time. You loop left and you read a marked symbol. You modify the marked symbol according to the transition function of the Turing machine, of the K tape machine. That may involve switching a one and then moving this here, then you do so. 
you know, the dot represents the uh, position of the tape head, the i tape head. If you run out of space, you pause the simulation, you enter a very large subroutine that perhaps does a shifting, it, it just shifts everything around and then inserts a blank, right? And then you resume. So one step of this machine to tape simultaneously may take like linear number of steps here, right? Non-trivial simulation, yet it still works correctly, right? Notice that although this machine may have some tape that infinitely, it just like writes A infinitely, whatever, each instant of the machine only a finite amount of space has been used. Same here. Each instance of the machine, only a finite amount of space has been used. Any questions on that? This proof, this is an underspecified proof, I think. Not fully obvious what all the details are if I asked you to fill it in. Could you actually write out the Turing machine transitions? It would be pretty hard, but you believe you could do it, right? Yes? Can you somewhere and use this kind of model for like the last question too, right? Um, correct. But... Yeah, I suppose you could. You could just put only finite of the space has been used. Every time it tries to move left some, you pause, sh shift, resume. Computation is local. Only a small part of the tape has been used at any moment. That would work as well. Um, this simulation, though, the folding simulation, uh, we haven't talked about the time complexity at all, but this is a more efficient simulation. Shifting takes linear time for one step. It's not very good. More questions on this one? Question? Could you use this if you didn't, like, if A was not set and you had new? I mean, that's basically how new, that's basically how the fork and exec work, right? They go, it's like fork, okay, well, let's go make some RAM over there. That's what happens. This, I think it would work. Con convince yourself that that doesn't matter because if you had K, where K could be chosen by the Turing machine, you really have one large two-dimensional tape and that each row is now an, uh, an, uh, the, uh, an unbounded in two directions tape. Turing's thesis, the geometry of the writing surface doesn't really matter. You could simulate a two-dimensional tape on a one-dimensional tape with difficulty, but it could be done. Right. Let me give you another simulation of this one, which is kind of interesting, and I'll leave it mostly for you to fill in the details. But again, the problem is that you have um, each head moving independently. So you can't simply just apply a tape compression. So what you do is you just kind of use extra tapes to simulate the positions of the tape heads. So suppose you had a machine that looks like this. Let's say there's tape one. It had like a one, zero, one, zero blanks. And the head was on the one. And then you had like a A, and the head was on the A. Right, something like this. What you could do is you, in fact, you simulate the K tape uh, Turing machine on a 2K tape Turing machine, and then that gets simulated on a uh, Turing machine. And the way that works is the K tape Turing machine, uh, what you do is you put this on four tapes. So here's two tapes. Something like this, where you put inter intermediate, the two tapes, you put four tapes, and then you put a little tape that just simply has the marker there. So the way the simulation then for this to, to work on a one, on a one tape Turing machine, would, uh, uh, I'll leave it to you to do it. But certainly, that simplifies the issue of having multiple independent tape heads. Because here you have one tape head that goes through each tape, and it can move the symbol and form, form the right as, as previously. It leaves a little, like a little Moncala marble on each tape head to know where, where it's supposed to be. Sort of a clear, uh, well, I think a less clear one than the, than the previous simulation. All right, any questions on K-tape Turing machines? All right, we have one more generalization. We've made three generalizations. They all failed to be stru strictly stronger than the Turing machine. Uh, there's one more generalization of a Turing machine that you can think of that we have not yet proven uh, 
anything about or even mentioned. If you had to say what it was, what is it? You have to guess. Give me a generalization of the Turing machine, which you would conjecture to not be equivalent. Uncommunistic? Yeah, a non-deterministic Turing machine. So we define a Turing machine to be like, um, it has a transition function, um, read a, at some state, read a symbol, uh, move to a new state, write some symbol, and then move left or right. The non-deterministic Turing machine is just that, but um, non-deterministic. So you read a symbol, and then you uh, move to a new state. You write a symbol, and then you non-deterministically, uh, well, hold on. There we go. You go to a power set of states. We also allow, like NFAs allow epsilon transitions and all that. Let's just allow that. Let's suppose you read, write, move. You just go to different states at once. So the non-determinism we define allows you to go to two states at once. Right? You read, you, there's, a, there's a world out there where the computation went one way and the computation went another way. This is a non-deterministic Turing machine. Right? Um, quick, why is it true that the simulation of a Turing machine, uh, a, t a Turing machine can be simulated in a non-deterministic Turing machine? One direction of the proof is easy. Why is that? Every deterministic system is non-deterministic without any of the non-deterministic features. Yeah. Just, just make a Turing machine a non-deterministic one, but it never maps to the power set of things. It just maps to the one element anyway. Same. By the generalization of non-determinism, every DFA is an NFA. It's the same. Every, uh, yeah, every DFA is an NFA. Uh, it's the same proof. Now, here's the tricky part. Why, we want to prove that, in fact, non-determinism, with respect to possibility, adds no power. This is tricky, because when you take Turing's argument, the other models seem to fall out kind of easily, because uh, like you could make your assumptions and accidentally end up on the state Turing machine ins instead of the Turing machine definition we gave. You, cannot, you absolutely cannot end up on the non-deterministic Turing machine, given Turing's argument. It's totally different of a machine. Yet, in some sense, this is like the most evidence in favor of the church Turing thesis. Because even though the non-deterministic Turing machine is weird, it's still fathomable. We may still simulate it in a Turing machine, but it's going to be a little involved now. It's kind of difficult. Um, the simulation is perhaps the most non-trivial of the ones we've done so far. A non-deterministic Turing machine may have transitions that look like this. You're at Q0. Uh, let's say you read W1. You write an A, and you move right, and then you're a QI. But if, you, if you're non-deterministic, you may read a W1. You may write a B and move right, right? QJ. And let's suppose this, this is a simple one, right? Of course, it could be move left, move right, whatever. But you read a W1. If you take the above transition, you write an A. You take the below transition, you write a B, right? That's a non-deterministic Turing machine. Uh, so if you're at. A configuration, what's your next configuration? Unfortunately, unlike deterministic Turing machines, it's not determined for you. Uh, you can think of a deterministic computation like a line, right? where the next one is determined uniquely by the previous one. But unfortunately, non-determinism is more like a rooted tree. So what we may do is put, we may describe a rooted tree as a, uh, where each node in the tree is a configuration of the non-deterministic Turing machine. So for example, we may have Q0, W1, Wn. This is the, f this is the initial configuration. That's the, again, a configuration is a snapshot encoding of the machine. This is how the non-deterministic Turing machine starts. It may go to A, Q, I, W2, Wn. Or it may go to B, Q, J, W2. WN, right? So this is what we, we may call a configuration graph of a machine. This, for example, may be a deterministic transition. Maybe it makes another non-deterministic transition. So we may represent a deterministic computation like a line graph, but we may represent a non-deterministic computation like a rooted tree, where each path in the tree is the possibility that you're doing. So here's how the simulator is going to work. We're going to simulate the non-deterministic machine deterministically by constructing its configuration graph and then searching over the configuration graph for an accept state. 
If an accepting computation exists in the configuration graph, then the non-deterministic machine accepts. By the way, we define the non-deterministic machine to accept or reject the same way we define an NFA. If there exists a computation to an accepting state, it accepts. If all computations re reject, it rejects. It's even weirder here for an, than an NFA because some branches of the non-deterministic computation may go into an infinite loop, some branches may accept, and some branches may reject. We would say the machine accepts if there exists a, a computation path to accept, and it rejects if uh, a computation path, all computation paths reject. If some computation paths reject and some computation paths loop, we don't know if it accepts or not. So unfortunately, we can't say it accepts that string. We don't know. It's undetermined. That would not be an, an NTM, which we would, we would say is a decider. Um, so basically, all we're going to do is take graph search algorithms on a tree and look for an accepting computation path. What are some graph search algorithms that you know? BFS, BFS is one. BFS is one. What's another? BFS. BFS, right? BFS is the right answer, but I wanted to make sure that we knew the other, the other two. Uh, if you had to choose between BFS or DFS here, which one would you choose? BFS. Why? Because DFS can get stuck in an infinite loop. Absolutely. DFS, again, would go depth first. It would go do 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 do. In the first branch you may find may be the one where you diverge. It may have an, you may get stuck in an infinite loop in the computation of the machine, so that branch of the NTM would be infinite. And you may miss, this may be the accepting configuration. You may just keep searching that way in the graph for one. Um, BFS, though, here's the, let me, let me make sure you, we illustrate exactly how BFS works. So we're familiar with it. So I'm going to give you a graph, and let's uh, perform BFS on this graph. Uh, S, let's say A, uh, B, uh, C, uh, D, and E. Something like this, OK? Uh, a BFS uses, what data structure does BFS use? Pop quiz. Algorithms question. Q. Q uses a Q. So the Q, you push uh, some start node, and then you pop it and add its children that, if, that have not been in the Q before. Uh, so you're going to push S to the Q. Let's say you start from S, and you want to explore the nodes in a certain order. What you're going to do is pop S off the Q and put its, push its children. And we'll represent popping off the Q as going leftmost off the Q. So now you're going to read A off the Q and push the, uh, the children of A. So you're going to push. So B is going to advance in the queue. And to the end of the queue, you're going to append C and D, right? Then you pop B off the queue, and you're going to append the children that have not been visited. A has been visited. D is in the queue already. E is next. It's going to be C, D, E, right? This is how the execution of BFS works. Pop C, any children have not been visited? No. Pop D, any children that have not been visited? No. Pop E, any children have not been visited? No. Right? So the order of visitation is S. A, uh, B, uh, C, D, and E, right? BFS kind of works like a wave. You'll never visit a grandchild before you finish visiting all the parents. From some node, you explore outward in a width way. It's breathed, breadth for search, right? That's how BFS works. We're going to do that on our configuration graph. So we won't accidentally miss an accepting configuration by getting stuck in some infinite loop somewhere. That's how the simulation works. So we need to basically encode a Q, somehow, a Q data structure onto the Turing machine. Here's the way I've defined it to work. There's a few ways you could do this. Uh, Suppose we have like Q0, W1 to Wn is one configuration of the graph. And we go to two nodes. We go to B, Q, J, W2 to Wn. And we go to, 
we go to A, Q, I, W1, W2, excuse me, to Wn. What we're going to do in the Q is what you can do sometimes. So there's no graph. The graph doesn't exist. The graph is not part of the input. The graph is implicit. So what, one thing you could do is construct the graph and then search over it. That's not good because in some cases the graph may be infinite. So what we're going to do is just simply use the Q to search over the graph the same, at, the same, at the same time that we build it. This is a child of this node. But we may not know that until we compute that it exists. So what we'll simply do is, given a computation, excuse me, a configuration, we'll compute using the non-deterministic transition function all possible uh, children and then just add them to the queue. So for example, let's suppose our tape begins in the following way. Here we grow our tape alphabet to be big enough to include states of the non-deterministic Turing machine, right? Something like this. What we're going to do is pop off the configuration of the queue, compute its children, and then add its children to the, add its children to the queue. So what the tape will look like at some point is going to be perhaps like this. Let's say the tape head begins here. Right, something like this. So what you do is you read a queue off the tape, you compute its configurations, and then you push the configurations to the queue, as in you write them to the queue. Now, how does this work? You actually need a couple helper tapes, and you need a lot of little subroutines to do this. But you would read a configuration off, and importantly, in the configuration, the reason this can be done is the fact that a configuration, one configuration to another, does not change more than a local portion of the tape. Only near the tape head, does a configuration change. The rest of the tape is unchanged from one step to another. So what you do is kind of look, look near the configuration, the state queue that you're putting there, modify it, and then write it to the tape. Right? That's all that needs to be done. Um, right. Um, if, suppose the non-deterministic uh, Turing machine accepts, then this, uh, we'll write it out. Uh, if n accepts w, then there is some computation. Uh, there, are some, there is some accepting configuration in the graph somewhere. This Turing machine deterministically will perform BFS, and it will find it, and it will accept. So D accepts. Uh, if N uh, rejects W, so we should define what happens with a, when a machine rejects. Let's suppose you are computing configurations in this way in a Q manner, and you find a rejecting computation. What should you do? Keep going. Yeah, so we could say you DQ it or you get rid of it. Just pop it off the queue. Get rid of it and just see if the others reject. If n rejects w, then all computations should reject. So at any point if the queue is empty, uh, d rejects w. d will accept w when it finds a configuration. d will reject w if the queue is empty. Now what if n, uh, n loops on all branches? or even some of its branches and rejects on some of the branches. D will perform infinite search. D, D loops as well, right? So the simulator loops when the simulatee loops. Great. It, that's, about as, that's about as much correctness as you could ask for a simulation proof, right? Um, fill in the details, add some helper tapes, add some subroutines. I think you guys could do it. Right. Questions on this one? Yes? Exponential. Uh, Great comment. Let's, let, let's make a comment on this. What is the time complexity of BFS in general? Does anyone remember it? Uh, o of V plus E. V plus E? And why was it O of V plus E? Because you visit every verse you have once. Yeah. I mean, so like more clearly, the, 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 when you use the adjacency list representation of a graph, the size of the input is v plus e. And BFS, another way to think of it is that BFS is linear 
time in the size of the input. It loops over the input once. BFS has a linear time algorithm. Now, BFS has to look at the whole graph once, and that's how, why BFS is so fast. If, uh, if uh, n accepts w in, let's say, n steps, well, let's say t steps, uh, d accepts w in how much time? Now, we haven't defined time complexity, but imagine you define a time complexity of a Turing machine to be the number of steps it takes. The number of times you apply the transition function until you reach an accept state. Roughly speaking, if D performs BFS, what time, how much time sh should D take? Yeah. The number of characters in the alphabet to the power of T? To the power of T? I'm going to say that's like, I'm going to say almost the same answer, which is 2 to the ct, uh, which is equal to 2 to the o of t for some c, right? In some sense, this is exponential in the number of steps the non-deterministic Turing machine makes, but this is linear size in terms of the size of the graph, right? The size of the input of n is w, but the size d has to perform graph search on what is perhaps an infinitely big uh, graph. The graph, the configuration graph of the non-deterministic Turing machine could be as big as a binary tree, but it will have depth n, because n, there is a computation path that takes, excuse me, t. Will, if n accepts w in t steps, then you know that the depth of the computation is t, because the accepting computation bra branch takes t steps. Non-determinism, you measure it. You get, if there exists an accepting computation path. So it's simply the depth of the thing, so it's depth, depth t. If you have a binary tree that's maximally branching of depth t, it's of size 2 to the t, right? So this, unfortunately, takes exponential time. d takes exponential time to simulate the non-determinist Turing machine, but the simulation can be done. Now, this is a very interesting question, is can this be improved? Uh, there's an allegory I want to make to the p versus np problem, which is basically this problem. P is the class of languages decidable by Turing machines that take polynomial, there's a polynomial bound in the number of steps they take on any input. We'll talk about this much more rigorously later. NP, you may have a definition of deterministically verifiable computation. We jokingly say NP is not polynomial, but that's not what it means at all. The N in NP is non-deterministic polynomial time. So you measure this weird machine with a different stopwatch about how it makes a number of steps, right? We think P does not equal NP because, uh, like, uh, again, we'll basically explain it for uh, half the course about why we think that. But it, immediately we see some evidence that maybe it's not true. Because if n takes perhaps polynomial time, the simulator for it takes exponential time. So it's not necessarily true that it's in p. In fact, even a slight speed up of this, even an asymptotically like a 2 to the square root log or something, something very small, would have grave consequences for this problem. We don't know any faster way to speed up the simulation than doing this BFS thing. We have no idea how to do it. Also immediately implied, if you can get a, a non-trivial BFS al algorithm, if you can get a, sup, uh, a faster BFS algorithm, you can actually say something about P versus NP, right? The problem has roots uh, everywhere. Either way, uh, we are in the unit on computability theory. So we're concerned not about complexity yet. We'll talk about this much later. Well, we're concerned about uh, possibility. So what are machines capable of at all? Um, and we see that the non-deterministic Turing machine can't do more than the deterministic one. This huge generalization, it fails to be super strictly stronger. Right. QED. Questions on those proofs? All right, let's take a break. <laughs>